Hello and welcome back to our channel, where we delve into the complex yet fascinating world of healthcare and medicine. Today, we are unpacking a rather intricate topic, the use of unfractionated heparin or UFH in the intensive care unit and the phenomena of heparin resistance. If you've ever wondered about the choice of anticoagulants in critical care or why some patients may resist the effects of UFH, this video is just for you. Now, unfractionated heparin has long been the favored anticoagulant in many ICUs. The reason? Its rapid onset and offset of action, and the fact that its effects can be fully and rapidly reversed with protamine, making it a lifesaver in situations where anticoagulation control is vital. UFH is especially crucial for patients with severe multi-organ failure or those hooked up to extracorporeal circuits, such as the ECMO or the extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. Unfractionated heparin, a mixture of glycosaminoglycans derived from pig intestines or bovine lungs, works by catalyzing antithrombin, an endogenous inhibitor of various coagulation factors including thrombin and factor exa. But, like all medical interventions, UFH comes with its own set of challenges. One major issue? The large variability in its anticoagulant effect across different individuals. This brings us to heparin resistance. Simply put, it is when UFH fails to achieve a certain level of anticoagulation despite administering what we think should be an adequate dose of the medication. Now, how we define, adequate, has been a point of contention. Some say it's when a patient requires more than 35,000 units of UFH per day, but that definition can be problematic. It doesn't account for body weight, clinical setting, or the occurrence of thrombotic complications. During the COVID-19 pandemic, an increase in heparin resistance was reported in critically ill patients, sparking further interest and debate on the topic. Today, we're going to discuss UFH monitoring options, delve into the mechanisms of heparin resistance, and explore how we can manage this complex condition in ICU patients. Let's dive right in. Now, when it comes to monitoring UFH, the activated partial thromboplastin time, or APTT, is the most common method. But there's a catch. Many pre-analytical and analytical variables can affect the APTT, and they're not related to heparin anticoagulant activity. In fact, this could lead to APTT being inappropriate for UFH monitoring in many ICU patients. Let's take a look at some examples. High factor 8 levels may actually shorten the APTT, whereas low fibrinogen levels or the presence of a lupus anticoagulant can prolong it, and all this is independent of heparin. Further complicating matters is that the APTT therapeutic range isn't standardized since it's highly dependent on the reagent and analyzer used. So, in light of these issues, chromogenic antifactor exa assays are increasingly being utilized for UFH monitoring because they offer better specificity. For these tests, the commonly accepted target therapeutic range is between 0.3 and 0.7 international units per milliliter. Remember, though, these results can still vary depending on the reagent and analyzer used and may also be influenced by factors such as hemolysis and icterus. Now that we've discussed monitoring UFH, let's tackle the complex world of heparin resistance. What makes some patients less responsive to UFH? Several factors can contribute to this, and it often starts with acute phase reactants. Components such as von Willebrand factor, factor 8, and fibrinogen can bind to negatively charged heparin fragments. In ICU patients, elevated levels of these heparin binding proteins can lead to reduced bioavailability of the drug. That's not all. Extracorporeal circuits and tubing can also bind to UFH, further limiting its availability. Another common cause of heparin resistance is acquired antithrombin deficiency. This condition frequently occurs in ICU patients due to factors like sepsis, disseminated intravascular coagulation, ECMO support, or liver disease. Platelet factor 4, or PF4, released from activated platelets, is another culprit that can bind to UFH, leading to resistance. In cases of thrombocytosis, which is an abnormally high platelet count, the risk of heparin resistance can increase. Intriguingly, if a patient has heparin resistance and a simultaneously dropping platelet count, it could signal heparin-induced thrombocytopenia type 2, this is a serious condition and should trigger immediate diagnostic and therapeutic responses. 
With understanding of what causes UFH resistance, the question now is, how can it be managed, especially in the ICU? One of the first things to do when the heparin dose requirement is much higher than expected is to use chromogenic anti-exa assays. In these cases, it's always a good idea to double-check analytical results before modifying the dose or therapeutic strategy. It's also important to collect blood on citrate, theophylline, adenosine, dipyridamol mixture or CTAD. This helps rule out in vitro PF4 release from platelets as the underlying cause of the resistance. Now, if antifactor X activity is low, say less than 0.3 IU per milliliter, then the UFH dose should be increased to achieve a target of 0.3 to 0.7 IU per milliliter. For patients with acquired antithrombin deficiency, administration of antithrombin concentrates could be considered. That said, the benefits of this supplementation isn't yet clearly established outside of cardiac surgery. Extracorporeal Life Support Organization, or ELSO, guidelines recommend daily monitoring of antithrombin levels when heparin demand increases and maintaining levels at 50 to 80 percent. Take note, though, that antithrombin supplementation can contribute significantly to increased costs associated with UFH anticoagulation in ECMO patients. Two alternatives to consider are bivalirudin and argatriban, both of which are direct thrombin inhibitors, or DTIs. They directly inhibit free and clot-bound thrombin, independently of antithrombin. Remember, it's crucial to closely monitor these drugs as specific antidotes are lacking. They're typically monitored with APTT, but also with anti-EA assays in the case of argatriban. Evidence is emerging that these DTIs can be effective in managing heparin resistance. But, it's important to note that observational data, even when using elaborated tools for risk adjustment, have their limitations. A brief on all drugs. Unfractionated heparin. It's a glycosaminoglycan with a molecular mass between 3,000 to 30,000 daltons. UFH targets both factor EXA and EA, also known as thrombin. It inhibits free plasma thrombin and requires antithrombin as a cofactor. UFH is eliminated through the reticuloendothelial system, endothelium, and kidneys. It's monitored using APTT and antifactor EXA level. Next, we have argatriban, a synthetic arginine derivative with a molecular mass of 508 daltons. It specifically targets factor EA through monovalent binding to the active catalytic site. Argatriban inhibits free plasma and clot-bound thrombin. Unlike UFH, it doesn't require a cofactor. It's eliminated through the liver and is monitored using APTT and antifactor EA level. Lastly, bivalirudin, a polypeptide with a molecular mass of 2,180 daltons. Like argatriban, it targets factor EA but binds in two places, the active catalytic site and the substrate recognition site. Bivalirudin inhibits free plasma and clot-bound thrombin and doesn't require a cofactor. It's eliminated both enzymatically by thrombin and through the kidneys. Monitoring involves APTT and antifactor EA level. Each of these anticoagulants has its unique properties and uses. However, this is a simplified explanation, and the actual use of these drugs in a clinical setting requires a deep understanding and careful monitoring. For instance, the starting dose of argatriban in ICU patients with or without ECMO is 0.5 micrograms per kilogram per minute, but in multi-organ dysfunction, it's 0.2 micrograms per kilogram per minute. Thank you for joining us on this deep dive into UFH resistance. Stay curious, stay informed, and most importantly, stay safe. Until next time.